Hey, Visual Preacher community, it's Steve Thomason, and I've got another great interview for you here on the podcast and the YouTube's channel. So uh, today I'm interviewing the Reverend Dr. Rolf Jacobson. Rolf is a Lutheran pastor. He is a professor of Old Testament at Luther Seminary, and he is one of the key players in workingpreacher.org. Oh yeah, the source itself. And so I thought since I'm writing this book for Working Preacher book series, this would be great to talk to somebody that's actually on the inside of Working Preacher. And uh, so we talk about Working Preacher a little bit in this interview, and then I ask Rolf some questions from a Lutheran preacher's perspective about using visuals in preaching. He's got some great insights into how Luther himself used visuals, so check it out. Listen to this interview. Enjoy. And if you like what we're doing here at visualpreacher.com and you'd like to help be part of this conversation to help me do the research and to write the best book I can possibly write about using visuals in preaching, I hope that you'll like, you'll share, you'll subscribe, join the conversation. All right. Enjoy the interview. So the Reverend Dr. Rolf Jacobson is on the podcast. <laughs> thanks for being here today, Rolf. Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks. So um, I'm excited about our conversation. You, uh, as you know, and just a reminder, we're talking about um, this opportunity that I'm very excited about to be able to contribute to the Working Preacher book series, a book specifically about using visuals in preaching. Yeah, we're, we're so excited to have you doing it. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, so I, I wanted to talk to you because, um, first of all, you are a key player in the Working Preacher organization, yep. and you are a Lutheran pastor and a, uh, what's the best way to call you, a uh, professor, scholar Seminary. of Hebrew literature, Old Testament? Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a seminary professor, uh, Old Testament. Old Testament is what I teach. I'm a professor of Old Testament. And you are an expert in the Psalms. Psalms is my narrow specialty. That's correct. Yeah, very cool. Um, so let's start big and just talk about um, some people listening may not know what Working Preacher is. So like, what's the history? What is Working Preacher and what's your involvement? Working Preacher is a website uh, out of Luther Seminary where I work uh, that we started a little, a little over 10 years ago. Um, and it was started by our preaching prop at the time named David Lose. Um, and the idea was that pastors uh, face a challenge every week, a working preacher do to write a sermon. And so what we do is support them by providing columns uh, uh, on, the, on the assigned texts for two different lectionaries, the Revised Common Lectionary which has four texts for every week, or the narrative lectionary, which has one text for every week. And then in addition, there's a weekly podcast for both lectionaries. There's articles on the craft of preaching. There's a weekly column on preaching. And there is recently a book series called um, Working Preacher Books that we have you writing for. We're really excited about your volume. Sweet. Well, that's excellent. So how long has that been going on? A little over 10 years. Um, we celebrated our 10th uh, uh, I think it's been going really 11 years now. And I'm curious to know, like, if you have any kind of gut feeling and or empirical data around how helpful and the impact that it has had in the preaching community. Absolutely. Well, um, I think we're the number one lectionary uh, based website, uh, preaching website uh, in the world. Um, you know, that um, our, um, in our I know millions of hits per years, our data, which I don't really trust, said 2.9 different, 2.9 million different devices connected with the site last year. I, I don't know that I quite trust that, but just that data shows well over 3 million hits. I think it's over 4 million hits. Um, and then plus a lot of downloads of the podcast and the app. And the very fact that uh, people support us financially with um, uh, gifts, it's not subscription based. So um, yeah, so in the, there's a lot of evidence that it's widely used. Yeah, I know it's been a great tool for me when I first started uh, preaching 
in the Lutheran tradition uh, way back in 2010. I started listening to it and I, I knew you through the podcast before I ever met you in person. So that's <laughs> right. Cool. It's been great. Yeah. So I appreciate all the work that you guys have been doing on it. And um, so now you, I know, so you are in the midst of thinking about these texts and thinking about preachers because you're a working preacher. Mm -hmm. And I know that your scholarship is not around preaching itself. Correct. You are a seasoned Lutheran pastor. And I know it's part of not just your academic, but it's part of your passion and it's part of your family history as well. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was uh, feedback on some observation that I've made. Uh, some of my research on other books that have been written about using visuals kind mm -hmm. of show that, that there's a history within Lutheran preaching particular, but you don't have to limit it to Lutheran, um, that there's been kind of a, an aversion to the use of visuals. And is, is that true? And just speak into that, like. I would say, I, um, I would say no, okay. historically, but maybe recently. So, I have, uh, first of all, uh, I hate to, uh, well, I don't hate this. Have you read a book called Brand Luther by Andrew Peterman? I am familiar with it. Yeah, I, I, I have heard people in different podcasts talking about it. I haven't read it, but I know it's all about his use of visual and, and well, it's printing. The, and it's the, I, I just actually wrote the author a couple hours ago. I've never met him. He's out of the St. Andrew University in Scotland. Um, but it's a, it's the best creative book on Reformation history I've read in a long time. And he argues that he tells the story of Luther and the Reformation through Luther's uh, publications. And one of the things he argued, and I wish I had the book with me, but I, I left it at home uh, today. Um, the book says that Luther became a brand and he became the best known man in Europe because of his use of the printing press, but also then the way Lucas Cranach, who was the, the town artist in Wittenberg, then created a visual brand to go along with the pamphlets uh, that became brand Luther. So from the very start, the communication of Luther's ideas, it was central to, that he put he put out little treatises, sometimes pamphlets, um, and uh, that often then from, from very early in, included Cranach's brilliant artistic interpretations uh, of of the um, of his ref, of his gospel ideas, his rediscovery of the gospel, and that became crucial. Cranach's visual interpretation of his theological interpretation of the Bible became crucial to the success of the Reformation. And so you can um, you can probably find this and dump into this podcast uh, uh, different Cranach uh, illustrations. I probably have some here in my office somewhere. But like one of the famous ones is of um, Luther, uh, the famous image of Luther uh, that's still in Wittenberg in the in the chapel or the, the cathedral church today is Luther in the pulpit pointing at Jesus, holding the Bible in the one hand, open to the book of Romans, pointing to Jesus on the cross. That's what preaching is. See, right? There it is, the visual. The Bible in one hand, pointing the listener to Jesus Christ, visually. And Cranach did that. Like one of the early editions, I think, not of the 95 Theses, but maybe of uh, one of his early things then, Cranach has on one page, um, if I remember, uh, basically um, an interpretation of Catholic theology that's quite negative. We don't need to go there, but an interpretation <laughs> of the gospel that's quite positive. It might be really the sheep and the goats. I can't remember, but visually then from the start. And Luther, uh, there was a, this, a very big important part of communicating the gospel in the Lutheran range was visual. And, and um, Luther then in the churches, that became very important is to make sure that you got the right visual represent, re representations in churches 
Um, so the Lutheran Reformation never became like the Reformed Reformation um, of burning, burning art and burning down visual images like Calvin and Calvinism came to do. And you can see it in Lutheran churches today. Lutheran churches today, the traditional ones, um, would, will have art in them, uh, images, stained glass, um, and not just be white paint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I'm so glad you went there because that just opened up a whole new window for me. So can, let me see how close I can get this. Oh, yeah. So, so here you can see this is an example of it. And what you have here is Luther, right, holding up uh, the Bible. And he's standing, I think he's being held up by a bunch of other folks who are Reformation figures like Philip Melanchthon. Mm -hmm. And he is confronting the Pope on his throne and the whole church magisterium there, right? Yeah. And so you yep. can see that's an example of, um, um, sorry, he's not being held up, but uh, he's standing, Luther's above the others, and Philip Melanchthon, one of his buddies, and is there with pen. He's going to write down what Luther says, and he's confronting the whole magisterium. So you can see that that's really, it's part of it. Now, somebody might say, yeah, but that doesn't mean we use it in preaching. Well, that was about getting the preached word out there. Totally. And so I think in that tradition, to the extent that we can do that sort of thing today, it's right within the faithful tradition, at least in my Lutheran, in our Lutheran tradition of, of, uh, of getting that out there. That's very cool. I love that. Um, so, I was reading in, in one of the books that was talking about using visuals that maybe it's not an aversion to visuals per se, but projection inside of the worship space or using images. Have you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I think that, I do think that the, the one, you know, so the, the second commandment, which in Lutheranism is buried within the first commandment, um, but the second commandment, you shall not make a graven image of anything in heaven. That is, you shall not make an image of God. Is, um, that was kind of recovered then um, by, by the Reformed tradition. And then they said, we shouldn't have any images at all. And uh, I do think that the not, we should never have an image of God the Father. Um, I think that that's true. And so like the famous issue on the Sistine Chapel uh, of an old man with a beard, think about just like the negative impact of picturing God as an old man with a beard. We shouldn't an acceptable of God is the image of Jesus, the incarnate word. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, the Bible never describes what he looked like, which is interesting. So, um, you know, they never said, you know, what color his eyes were or whether he was tall or, you know, anything like that. Um, so even there, we should be a, a, a little careful um, uh, and, and privilege the fact that every human being is the image of God to us. Uh, so I think that's really important. Um, projecting, you know, what I would say is um, there is something really valuable to calling up someone's imagination. And so that's a caution not that's a slight caution against um the overuse of images L let me give you an example um, um so back uh, before i was in seminary even one of my favorite teachers jim Lindbergh, uh was preaching uh, in advent on an advent text that's coming up this december actually where it says in isaiah 2 i think it's the second sunday of advent um Nations shall come to, uh, to Mount Zion, um, and they will study the way of the Lord, and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and nations shall not go to war against nation anymore, and they will not study war, right? So Lindbergh went to the farm museum here, uh, in the Gibbs Farm Museum, and he borrowed an anvil for chapel, and he brought it to chapel with a big uh, sledgehammer. And he said, in the culture, the ringing at this time of year is the sound of the ringing of jingle bells. But in the Bible, in Advent, it's the sound of the ringing of the Prince of Peace hammering swords into plowshares, right? Now, I just told you the story. 
I didn't go do it. My question is you, is it as effective just to tell it where you can imagine it? Is it more effective to actually go get it? Or would it be more effective to illustrate it if, like for you or to throw on the PowerPoint the, some image of maybe a soldier now beating a rifle into a plowshare, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that, and then not comment on it, but you could just put it there as you talk about, oh, and then show just images of um, harvest because it's into plowshares, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that um, the use of images, uh, for, first of all, we do need to wonder, is it good just to imagine? That's good, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Visual preaching could just be calling on people to use their visual imaginations. Mm -hmm. But also then, what is the next role to being, uh, to multiplying the effect um, and, um, and maybe pausing in the sermon and having music while people look at a series of images of peacemaking? Hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so, uh, since you ha are on the Working Preacher book committee, yep, book committee, I am curious to know, like, what were some of the formational questions that led your group to say, you know, we really need a book about visuals? Like that, that could really help set some foundational questions around this topic. Like you guys obviously felt a need in the yep. preaching world. So what was that behind, what were the thoughts behind those conversations? Well, I mean, it's people are doing it. And some people are, some people are using uh, PowerPoint or Keynote or some other presentation software. So they're doing it, first of all. So we might as well help think about it. Mm -hmm. um, some people think, like you said, and nobody on our committee just thinks, well, it's bad that they're doing it. They should stop. But rather, well, if people are going to do it, um, what does it mean to do it well? How would you even begin to think about whether it's uh, if it's helping or hurting? Where, where do you start? How do you do it? Um, what does it mean for preaching that it's happening? I just think all those questions bubbled up right away. And I, mm -hmm. of course I said, I know a guy <laughs> yeah. who illustrates his own sermons and I've seen it and I've seen how effective it is. I think a lot of people are visual learners. Mm -hmm. we, we live in the age of visual see, right? Uh, mm -hmm. As one person, I can't remember who coined it, uh, when essentially you're seeing images all day long, um, you know, mo we see more images in a day or a week than Martin Luther saw in his entire life. That's right. And so, uh, you know, um, so you could make the case, well, let's have the worship space then be a, a sanctuary from that. Mm -hmm. That's one approach. But the other approach would be to say, well, people think visually. And so what does it mean to, um, you know, how does it change? For instance, what is a mustard bush look like mm -hmm. when jesus says it's the tiniest of seeds but it grows into this huge bush well have you ever seen a mustard bush they're like they grow 20 30 40 feet tall it's right like mm -hmm. oh i didn't know that i was thinking it was a little right, right. so it really helps a parable come alive yep. i think yep. when you actually show them stuff like that so yeah where do you i mean first of all i hope that you'll in the book say um, here's, here's a typology of just how to think about images. And here's a typology of about how to think about the use of images in a sermon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for instance, um, and that's your work to figure that out. But so um, which, which one of the neighbors was it? Uh, I, I can't remember if it was uh, Richard or, or Reinhold. I think it was Reinhold book Christ and Culture. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, so he comes up, well, there's Christ against culture, Christ, mm -hmm. you know, within culture, you know, he's got these different frames. Well, so then he present, he made that framework and then that's the book, right? But then I also, so I think in some ways to give us a way to think about hmm. um, 
uh, uh, just a framework just to think about images or images in preaching. And then a little bit of how to, but actually not much, probably um, in terms of where do you get images that you can legally use? I suppose mm -hmm. that's a good question. I, right, I, right. I suspect a lot of people are illegally using images and we don't want them to do that. Mm -hmm. Probably. Probably. You probably wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, then there's it's people. Probably illegal um, to, you, to use the Cronach image if you were to scan it out of this book in a sermon. I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But there's probably a legal way to find it uh, in, in the public domain for use. Right. Probably. Right. Yeah, and those are those are technical and legal issues that need to be at least footnoted in an appendix. Yes. <laughs> um, well, at least in an appendix. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's great. So that that was really helpful. Just getting behind the scenes as far as the decision and the thoughts behind yeah. the book itself. Um, turning theological for a moment. So. Mm -hmm. you, as an Old Testament scholar and Hebrew scholar and specifically in the Psalms, I'm just curious, what's your theological imagination around visual and preaching from that framework? Like, is there any connection you can make to the Psalms or to um, a biblical precedent for that? Well, I mean, just, just that poetry Poetry requires visual imagination, mm -hmm. and the 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 the, the Psalter starts off with a picture, right? Uh, Blessed is the man who does not uh, walk in the path, or let's see, what is it? it does not um, walk in the way of the wicked, stand in the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is on the law of the Lord. On it he meditates day and night. He is like a tree. So it starts with the image of different roads and then a tree planted by water. And to, it says basically to meditate on the Torah of the Lord day and night will make you like a tree that's planted by water. Well, why is that a good image for a life that's immersed in Torah scripture? You know, so right there, uh, you get this powerful, the, the Psalter starts with an image. And of course, um, you don't have to think, you don't have to think, Biblically, historically, I, I invite groups, you know, uh, picture a tree that uh, does not um, die in rough weather, but it's, it yields fruit in due season, right? And so what, what tree do you, uh, so I'm, I'll ask you, what tree do you picture? A tree that doesn't die in, like the evergreen tree, right? That, right, that so like bear fruit. Well, does bear pine cones and pine nuts and grows all, all year long. Right. But I always think of an apple tree. Yeah, but so I invite people to think about a tree and everybody picks, uh, uh, everybody, they don't all pick the same tree. Um, historically, it's probably a date palm tree that the author has in mind, right? Oh yeah, right. It yields dates. And, uh, but in, uh, we live in Minnesota where the trees that don't, uh, lose their leaves are like you say they're they're these evergreen trees and the fruit they don't bear fruit but so if you but so i think it is still an image for the enduring resilient life of faith um that anyone can resonate with you know yeah so those are those are word pictures so the like you said the imagination uh, i like what you said earlier about what if we just invite the the congregation to imagine a visual because mm -hmm. um, I know that part of what the book needs to refer to is what I'm calling the analog preacher who is preaching in a space that has uh, no technology quote unquote right um, that there's tons of ways to use visuals in that space and one of there them are. is simply the imagination um, Think about, okay, um, a gesture is a visual. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. A gesture, whether it's Luther pointing at the cross yeah. or you welcoming people or scolding them. Yeah. Right? Even how you hold your face. Right? Is a visual. Yeah. I just, I was, uh, you know who you should really, this would be really challenging for you to do. 
I don't know if you can do it on a podcast, actually. I went to a, a deaf culture awareness workshop a couple weeks ago. Mm. And so one of the things I learned is um, that when you are um, watching a deaf person sign American Sign Language, you're supposed to watch their face, mm. not their hands, mm. because their face is so much part of the meaning. So they might have one word. Uh, I don't know what this word means. Uh, um, they will have one word for, let's say, a concept that spoken people will have multiple words with different nuances. Mm -hmm. But they communicate nuance through their face. Right. So like we have, just think about this. We have all the different words for, to walk. We have walk, stroll, hike, trudge, right? And so let's just say this, I don't, this probably doesn't mean what, but you could say you can communicate trudge like this, or you can stroll, you could do it with this, right? Yeah. Now just, so as a preacher, how much of your preaching can you communicate with your face? Mm. And um, most preachers that I know communicate boredom. That they're bored. <laughs> They're bored with their own sermon, dude. <laughs> and if, I'm, if you're bored with your sermon, then I'm going to be. Now, I noticed, by the way, one thing about you is you, you communicate energy without trying to be, you know, something you're not. Like, when you preach, you're like, I, this, I got passion here. Yeah. And uh, that's something I learned about preaching uh, from you is, uh, to, how do I do that? How do um, I'd already decided that most people were communicating through their body language, that this isn't an urgent message. And in fact, I'm already bored with it. Yeah. Um, so you've got to do that much at least, but so yeah, there's visuals, ge gestures, faces, but also moving around. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, move over to the baptismal font or the Lord's uh, table. If it's appropriate, don't do it every week because it's predictable. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, that's, that's really good. I just, just the whole nonverbal visual uh, body language, yeah. facial expressions. I love that. That again, that opens up a whole new chapter, a whole new window. Uh, very, very cool. Thank you. Um, My dad used to, I'm sorry, you were going to ask something, but I'm No, go for it. My dad, every once in a while, would get a really good idea. And then he would spend Saturday building something as part of his sermon. I remember a, a big ladder type thing that he built with Jacob's ladder as a kid. Um, I remember myself um, preaching on um, the metaphor of the household of faith and having two by fours and a door and a roof, right? Uh, copying my dad in some ways. Um, that is, I, so there's other ways that people can use visuals without having a PowerPoint system. But you know, that takes that takes work is the thing. Mm -hmm. So you gotta get the you can't get the idea Saturday night. You gotta get it in time to be able to go out and spend. Dad would have to do it uh only and he would only do it when he had uh got the idea early enough to to be able to build something physically, right? Yeah. Um like one time I preached uh, when you and I worked, I don't know if you were working there yet uh, at this congregation at Easter Lutheran. Uh, it was the, it was the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. So it was three years ago, I suppose, right about now. And um, or, uh, four years ago, sorry. And um, I had my son who at the time was 11 dress up as Baal, the, the, the Canaanite idol, false god Baal. And he, so he came in carrying a, a lightning bolt and a hammer, uh, um, the hammer symbolizing thunder, right? Lightning and thunder. And he came in dressed up like the statues we have of Baal to kind of show the people, I, I wonder, say, you know, who's Baal? Well, Baal's the god of the thunderstorm. I could just tell them that. Or I could tell them that and say, when he's pictured in the Canaanite art, he's pictured holding a lightning bolt and a hammer, thunder and lightning. Or I could put it on the screen, or I could have my son dress up and come in and clown around, right? Yeah. And I chose to do that. They um, won't forget that. Well, I hope not. They probably did, but you know, <laughs> I had fun that day. I wasn't bored, sure. right? Yeah. And, uh, so 
that's another way, right? Is people can come in as a Bible character. Sure. People, you know, people can come in um, as, uh, as uh, like the story of when they find the, the scroll in the temple during King Josiah's time. Mm -hmm. You could start your sermon all bored and have the archivist of the church run in and say, I found the Bible. <laughs> we we aren't doing any of this stuff. What is wrong with us, right? Oh my gosh, Terry! You know, pulls up hair, rips his shirt, right? You know, you can have fun time. That's visual. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> oh man, that that's excellent, and that made me think about like the use of drama, right? You know, drama is a visual cue, and totally. uh, so this leads me to. This is a question that comes up a lot, and I'm really curious to your take on it. And part of it has to do with control, right? Because mm -hmm. one of the things that I've heard that people are a little concerned about is that when you use a visual, you have no control over how people interpret the visual. That's true of everything. Yeah, so say more about that. Like, how would you respond to that critique of visual? I, well, you don't have control over your anything. <laughs> I mean, I once used an illustration. I was my very first sermon ever at a, at a church. And I used, it was about freedom. And I was trying to make contrast Americans' view of freedom, which is freedom from with, with Christian freedom, which is freedom for the neighbor. And I was very careful to have two examples of American freedom. One was a male and one was a female, a man and a woman. Well, uh, some women in the church decided, uh, it was my very first sermon, that that sermon uh, was anti-woman. I was very careful to have both a male and a female version that were examples of American freedom. But I had no control over what, how, uh, whether people were going to recognize that and what conclusions they were going to draw about me from it. Yeah, well. So you don't have control over anything, man. That's absolutely right. The, the spoken oh. word, uh, if you think you're controlling how people are going to hear it as a preacher, how many preachers have had this experience? Um, going back, or years later, somebody says, oh, I remember this sermon you preached. It changed my life. You go, that's awesome. You're the one I changed. Tell me about that. And then they tell you a sermon, you're like, no, no, no. I would never say, it. that's just wrong. I would <laughs> never say that, right? Every preacher I know has had that experience. That's right. And that's good, because that means the Holy Spirit is going to uh, use your sermon in ways that uh, you can't control either. That's right. That's so, right. yeah, I would say, actually, I thought it was going to be the opposite, which is visuals are too controlling. Oh, tell me more about that. Well, like, so if you, uh, if you always picture God in visuals as an old man with a gray beard, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to really constrain. I mean, I think that's actually more of a risk, which is people don't engage their imaginations um, if, we're, if we're supplying the visual. I thought that was going to be the question. Yeah. And um, which, which I do think then that we have to, you know, um, so if Jesus in... I, so if somebody is not drawing their own Jesus, like you're an artist uh, and a cartoonist, but I'm not. And so if I'm going to use images of Jesus in my sermons, I would want to be careful to make sure I use them from many cultures. Mm -hmm. That it, Jesus, if Jesus is only one culture, then it better be first century Jewish. Right. But if it's going to be other than that, then use lots. Um, don't always have Jesus, you know, especially be a white European. Right. Um, so, I mean, and don't, uh, but then this helps you think through um, the, uh, are, you know, how, how constraining are any of your um, sermon illustrations or concepts that you're doing? Um, it, are you always the hero of your own stories? I've heard preachers, I know some preachers who they tell a lot 
lot of stories about themselves and they're always the hero of, of the mm. story. They're always the one with the, the insight or the one who uh, saves the day. And I think that's dangerous, right? But on the other hand, so I always try to, if I tell a story about myself, I always try to make sure I'm the one that was the one learning something and mm -hmm. not the, uh, and then somebody told me, yeah, but now uh, that's become too much. Uh, if you're the pastor and you're never, if you're always the clown, that's not good. Somebody told me. So I was like, mm -hmm. okay, well, I'll think about that. So just, yeah, I think to be aware of ways in which uh, through falling into predictable patterns, we can constrain people. Yeah, very cool. So totally different kind of question. Mm -hmm. um, do you have other resources, other places that you would recommend to look, other stones to turn over to explore visual preaching? No. Uh, I'm not very good at it. I mean, that's one of the reasons I am not a visual learner. Um, I'm very, um, I'm a very uh, word oriented, music oriented um, learner. And so I don't know of, I, I have to ask other people. I mean, I could, I could tell you some other folks that I would suggest you talk to. That's what I'm asking. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, Hans Weersma at Augsburg College, I would talk to. I would suggest uh, you visit. Um, I would even see if you could get Andrew Pedigree from St. Andrew University on, on your podcast who did this Brand Luther book. Um, I do think there are, you know, there's lots of books about um, um, Christian art. Um, there's a, I'm trying to look and see if I have it. It's probably behind me. Great, great video here, right? About seeing Bill Brown out of Columbia, William Brown, has a book about seeing the Psalms. I would suggest you talk to Bill. I can make that introduction if you want. Um, the um, Brent Strawn, who's just went to Duke, uh, does a lot of ancient icon iconography. So does Joel Lamont out of Emory. So some folks like that, I think uh, I could uh, uh, make introductions to. I think those would be uh, good folks. Um, Sarah Henrik uh, has done a lot um, with art and theology. Um, so she's an excellent resource. She's local here. She's retired from Luther Seminary. Oh, that's a great list. I appreciate it. Okay, one last question. Sure. Maybe. I might have one after that, but this question, I'm about to ask this question on the uh, Visual Preacher Facebook group. I'm going to ask people your top five questions that you hope this book will answer about visuals and preaching. I'm hitting you on the spot. Five questions you hope this book will answer. You want all five of them or just yeah, one? Give me your top five. Well, one would be, how should I think about images? Mm -hmm. um, second of all, um, how should I think about how an image uh, helps? Third, are there examples of when uh, having images don't help? Um, fourth, are, is video. Uh, what's the positive or negative about having videos in sermons? Um, and, and then fifth, probably there should be just something about where to find public domain. Uh, video uh, images that can be used um, yeah. and is there anything um, illegal about like if I take a picture of a live human being that I know uh, do I have to have their permission to use it you know what I mean mm -hmm. um, I know that every school I'm a part of or my kids are part of, they have to sign something giving the rights to use a photo. So my guess is you ought to do that even if you don't have to legally. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Those are great questions, I appreciate it. I do have one final question. Great. This is a fun question. All right. Preacher to preacher, thinking that preachers are probably listening to this, and I know you're a great storyteller. Most awkward or entertaining preaching story you can think of? When preaching went wrong, how about that? When preaching went wrong? Yeah. Boy, there's so many, frankly, uh, <laughs> that, that I could think of. You know, 
One is just all the malapropisms, you know. Um, I know that when I worked with you at Easter, um, I was uh, talking about the man who prostate, prostrated himself for Christ. And I just did it right there. And I was told later that I kept saying prostate, <laughs> which is, of course, an uncomfortable male organ. Uh, so that's, you know, malapropisms. My brother talked about, um, my brother talked about um, um, feeding the naked and clothing the hungry, you know, in a certain <laughs> once and we all have done those but those are sort of mild greg boyd uh preached uh at a, at a chapel at my son's school before my son was there and he has a book about uh letters uh from a skeptic yep. to his dad when his dad didn't believe and uh, then his dad came to believe before he died and he brought his dad with him to the uh to the sermon in a bag cremated and he and he went say hello to dad and he dropped <laughs> No and, way. <laughs> yeah, so that's like the most awkward or enter I think it's awkward entertaining that Boyd brought his dad and dropped him because hey, hi to dad, everybody. Hi, dad. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> you know Boyd at all. That's that's Boyd. That's a good so, one. Um yeah, those would be my uh those would be my uh examples, I think. That's excellent. Well, well Rob, hey, thanks I, for having fun, man. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time and uh I I look forward to maybe more conversations and and uh thanks for being part of working preacher and it's going to be awesome hey thanks all right Talk to you soon. okay bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.